felt pretty crappy last week at the end of the week, and then this weekend I was feeling you know, okay. This morning I, I felt great when I woke up, but I just have a lot of congestion. I've got this huge headache. So, I guess so. But I'll be all right. I think this will make me feel better by the time we're done. Are we your last class? Huh? Are we your last class today? Yes. Hmm? You have classes early in the morning? I had one before this. Yeah. Yeah, today's my, my shorter day. Shorter in terms of how long I'm here. No, I'm usually here by about 8.30. And then today's an exception, though. I have to go pick up my daughter from school. So I'll be leaving, like, right after class. But anyway, I don't know why we're talking about this. But let's get down to... Questions from the calculus? Um, anybody attempt to do any uh, curve sketching? No? You did? Yeah, I did. I did more so problems, but 13, man, I was still these guys back here. I think when I got down to the derivative and I was trying to find the like the local max and then or whatever. Uh-huh. So would you like me to entertain that one? Yeah. Yeah? Because I was telling them how, like, I think I used uh, L'Hopital, L'Hopital's rule mm -hmm. to make it work because at those, at those <coughs> specific points, uh, they're undefined, I think. Okay, well, let's, let's walk through it. My plan was I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have eight problems in 4.4 in, uh, circled that I know I can't do all eight today. But my plan was to see how many of these I could get through. Uh, 13 was not on that list, but since it's being requested, I will, I will do it. It's definitely fair game. So the equation was x over x squared plus 9. And we're asked to sketch this using the techniques of calculus. So I gave us sets of steps last time, didn't I? That we were going to try and kind of follow. Where is it? There it is. What was the first step? Find the domain. Find the domain? There it is. Find the domain. It's all real numbers. So there are the steps. So the domain of this, <coughs> all real numbers, because you can never make that denominator zero, right? x squared plus 9 can never be zero. Next thing, the x and y intercepts. So how about x intercepts? Zero. Just set the top to zero, right? That's the only thing you have to worry about. And that is actually the solution, x is zero. How about y intercept? Same. Same thing, right? You plug zero into the actual function and you get zero. So we, we started doing like a rough graph over here on the side. Just an idea what's going on. I know that the origin is part of my function. Check for symmetry. The main thing I wanted to know is whether or not f of x was equal to um, negative f of x, or f of neg negative x. Is it the same thing when we plug in negative <coughs> as we plug in positive? So let's see. Does this equal this. No, no. no, they're off by a sign. See, when I square the negative here, it'll still be x squared, but that'll be negative x, that'll be positive x. So this is not the same. What I do know, though, is that f of uh, <coughs> negative x is equal to negative f of x. The only difference between these two is that this one is that one negative, right? They're opposite in sign. <clears throat> so this is what you check to see if two functions are even, right? This is what you check to see if two functions are what? Odd. So it actually turns out that they are odd. That is an odd function, which means that it's not symmetric over the y-axis. It's symmetric over, do you remember? It's, it's y then x. It's actually what we call over the origin. 
So it's like a double reflection. I'll give you an example of an odd function over here, x cubed. Looks like that. The reason why this is odd is because if I reflect this over like that first, that would be what it is to be even, right? But then to be odd, we reflect that over the x-axis. And so you can see this is a, it's like a double reflection over y then x. That's what it means to be odd. So when I draw this, this should be odd. Whatever we get over here, if we reflect it over y then x, it sh that's what it's going to look like on the other side. All right. Um, <clears throat> asymptotes. What do we look at for a the asymptotes? Okay, so we're going to look at the horizontal asymptotes first. I'm going to take the limit as x goes to infinity of the, of the actual function. And then I'm also going to take the limit as x goes to negative infinity. That'll, that'll tell me what happens as I go out the left side. I'm just trying to determine the left and right behavior of this. So when x goes to infinity here, you get infinity over infinity. So we apply L'Hopital's rule one time. <clears throat> get 1 over 2x. And what does that go to? Zero. That goes to 0. What happens when x goes to negative infinity? So you get negative infinity on top over, let's see, a negative infinity squared is positive infinity, plus 9. You still get an infinity over infinity, don't you? Mm -hmm. And so I do L'Hopital. Derivative of the top is 1, derivative of the bottom is 2x. And now as x goes to negative infinity, this blows up, gets really big, negative, fixed number on top that goes to 0. So out both sides, right? <coughs> it's 0. So in my picture, I know that the x-axis acts as a horizontal asymptote. <coughs> yeah, so this is where I get confused afterwards. When okay. When you're trying to get the derivative, I didn't know whether to use your, your derivative, take the derivative of that local or? Oh, no, no. We that, that was just to figure out the end behavior. That's it. Uh, how about vertical asymptotes? Because we talked about horizontal ones. How about vertical ones? Zero. None? That, that denominator can never be zero, right? So verticals, I'm just going to put down here that I did think about it, right? None since x squared plus 9 cannot be equal to zero. All right, now I've got to figure out where the function is going up and down and concave up, concave down, all that stuff, right? And I'm going to make that table and put it all together. So let's get some derivatives here. Now, the, I could use f of x or y prime. They gave this to me as y, right? I mean, really they mean like f of x, right? That's, that's what we've been kind of doing. It's not, not a problem to convert that over. <clears throat> so what is, uh, what's f prime of x? So maybe quotient rule here. Derivative of the top times the bottom minus derivative of the bottom, which is just 2x times the top over the bottom squared. Which should clean up to be x squared plus 9 minus 2x squared over x squared plus 9 squared. nine minus x squared over x squared plus nine squared. I think that's probably as clean as I'm gonna get it. Yeah. All right, do you wanna work with this and start doing this stuff or do you wanna get the second derivative while I'm here? It's, you wanna do the second derivative now? Okay, so let's get the second derivative. I'll do it over here. Second derivative quotient again, a little more complicated this time. Derivative of the top is negative 2x times the bottom, which is a quadratic being squared, minus, now the derivative of the bottom is a chain rule, right? We've got something to a power. So the 2 comes out first, 
x squared plus 9 to the first power, right? But then times the derivative of what's inside of that, which is 2x. But then the derivative of, I'm sorry, not the derivative of, but then what? The top, <coughs> 9 minus x squared. Then all of that over the bottom squared, so to the fourth. Yeah, now we're going to start trying to factor stuff out. So um, let me try and highlight the things that I'm going to take out. I do see I have a common factor of 2 and an x, 2 and an x. I have an x squared plus 9, x squared plus 9, right? I believe that's the most that they both have in common. Yeah? And I could pull a negative 2 out or a positive 2. It's up to us. Any preference? You want to do negative? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to pull out negative 2x. And how many factors of x squared plus 9? One factor. <clears throat> That's what's being pulled out. What's left? I'm going to keep that right there. So what's left right here when I pull this up? x squared plus 9? I don't need it in parentheses, but I could put it in parentheses. Uh, we pulled the negative. So plus, that 2 is still here, right? 2, that's gone, and that's still here. So 9 minus x squared. All over x squared plus 9 to the fourth. Now, I'm going to try and clean up the stuff that's inside this bracket, like distribute the 2 through and clean up. I'm also going to notice that one of these factors cancel out with one of those factors and make that fourth power a third power. <clears throat> I'm going to re replace the brackets with the parentheses. Uh, how many x squareds am I going to have when I'm done here? Negative one of them? Yeah. And what constant will I have? Is it 27? 2 times 9, 18 plus 9. So 27, and then I have a negative x squared. <coughs> or minus x squared. Is that all right with you? over x squared plus 9 to the third. And again, I think that's probably about as clean as I'm going to get it. Is that all right with y'all? OK. You can get 2x cubed minus 54x if one is going up. You can get what? 2x cubed minus 54x on top. Oh, yeah, you could, you could distribute this through. Is that what you're saying? Yes, now the only reason I'm not going to is because I'm going to have to set the second derivative equal to zero at some point in time. And so I'll set the top to zero and then I'll want to factor it. So I'm just going to leave it factored. <coughs> we good? Let me see here. Which number was this? This was 15? 13. 13. All right. Yeah. All right. So now. Got our derivatives, now let's go to work on building up, you know, where it's going up and down, left and right, and all that good stuff. So where's the function in increasing and decreasing? So where is f going up and down? That's the question. So I take my derivative, right? I set it equal to zero, I take my derivative, I find out where it's undefined. Or where it doesn't exist. So what about the first derivative? Where is it zero? Nowhere. Nowhere. First derivative? Nine minus x squared. When nine minus x squared is zero. Right, you have to set the top to zero. This is our first derivative. Set the top to zero. You thought I was talking about undefined? OK. So where is it zero, this, and then that's x is plus or minus 3, right? And then 
Where is it undefined? There's no solution here, right? Basically, it doesn't apply, right? We just scratched it out. We said, ah, didn't, didn't matter. Now what? Number line. Number line. And so I'll do that here. Negative 3, 3. Those are the only two places I have, right? Mm -hmm. well, zero, right? Nope. We don't, no, nope. we only put it on this number line for the up and down if it's a critical number, okay? This was not a critical number. And so I check any points I want, test points, and those test points go and get plugged into what? Derivative. Nope. Derivative. 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 So how about we test negative 4, 0, and 4? that okay with you? And I'm going to plug those into this, and all I'm checking for is signs, right? Yeah. So let's try f prime of negative 4. It'll be, yeah, you know, negative 4 squared is 16. 9 minus 16 is negative. The bottom is always positive because I'm always squaring it. So is going to be a negative number? F prime of zero, it's a positive number. And then F prime of four, negative again. So that means that when I go to graph this, it's going to be going down, then up, then down, right? Do I have any local maximums or minimums? Yes. Yes? I have a local maximum where? Three. At three. And remember, you have to check, was three allowed to be plugged into your function? Yes. yes. The domain of our function was everything, wasn't it? So these are both included in the domain of the original function, so I don't have to worry about anything crazy happening there. So I have a local maximum at three and a local minimum at negative three. I don't need that to draw it. I mean, I don't need to state that, but I'm just pointing it out. All right, we're done with that part. Now we go to the second derivative, do the same thing. So for your second derivative, that tells us about the concavity, doesn't it? See if you can do that. Set that up, the second derivative, which was negative 2x, 27 minus x squared over x squared plus 9 cubed, right? See if you can plug in. Figure out where that's zero, figure out where it's um Y'all get that? 
So you go to a number line from here. Do I need to explain any of this, or are we good? Set the top to zero. Bottom is never zero. Top to zero, since it's already factored, I set each factor equal to zero. <coughs> the only reason I went to a decimal is so I have some idea where these are. All right. So when I draw them on my number line, I, I kind of have, I, I can easily determine where I should pick test points. And you could also have left it as root 27. That's fine. Test points. Negative 6. Positive 6. 1 and negative 1. And you're plugging those into the second derivative, right? So let's try and figure out what those are. So the second derivative at negative 6 is, you've got to be a little careful here. Negative 6 times negative 2 is positive, right? So I get a positive in that top left corner times negative 6 squared is 36. 27 minus 36 is a negative number. And then what about the bottom? It's always positive. Not because it's cubed, right? Because x squared plus 9 is always positive. So I have a positive on the bottom. So this is going to be a negative number. And that tells me about the concavity, right? Tells me I'm concave down over here. A frown, yes. And then I do the same thing for negative 1. So what happens when I plug negative 1 into the second derivative? <coughs> you get negative 2 times negative 1, which is positive. This is going to change, though, right? Negative 1 squared, 27 minus that. That's going to be a positive there. And then, of course, the bottom is always positive. So it's positive. So we do have a change in concavity there. Uh, I put negative 1 and negative 1. When I plug 1 in, does it change again? I think it does. It's negative, and then how about at 6? Positive. So it does switch. That means I have inflection points, right? Those inflection points, I have three of them, here, here, and here. Those points are all in the domain of my original function. So I believe I have all the information I need to draw this now. Are there any questions? Did I erase that too quick? Are we good? What do I, what do, what do I do at this point normally? I make this table, right? Yeah. The table. And I, I start with the number line, and I put the important points off of my first and second derivative off here. From the first derivative, we had um, 3 and negative 3. And, and from the second derivative, I had 0 and then root 27. I'll put root 27 instead of 3 root 3. And I'll put negative root 27 out here. And again, that's where, that's where knowing that root 27 is bigger than 3 helps. <coughs> and then I make this, these columns and then three rows, right? I'll never forget when I first ever, ever, um, I didn't teach Cal 1 my first semester in graduate school, but as a graduate student, we had to, uh, we had to be the uh, teaching assistant. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, basically you work for the school, 
and they assign you duties and they pay you while you're in school. Not much, just enough to eat bread and top ramen, but it's still, it's still better than having to leave to go to a job because you, you know, you're there on campus. So anyway, <clears throat> one of my duties was to do the, uh, what's called recitation where you, uh, I don't know if I told you about this, where you go, like I went into a room and then all the calculus students would come in and just ask me questions. And so um, I was asked to do a graphing problem and I was doing it this way. And like I told you, like the way I do it here is a little different than what the books, what books do. A lot of books, and if you ever go to a tutor, most tutors will do like this thing where it's like a sign chart with these positives and negatives in here to try and figure out. And it, it's confusing, I thought. When I was learning, it was confusing. So I, I like this way that I did it, where I do the uh, derivative, second derivative, and then the function. That's just kind of my way. <clears throat> so I did this session where I did the problem, and, and there was this one student in there. I don't know what his deal was, but he came and found me like, two days later in, in the tutoring lab. Like, we had a lab like that, but it was not as big. And uh, I just, the way I remember it is he came in, and, and in my memory, it was like him kicking the door down, you know, and coming in, hey, and got all pissed off at me because he was, it was one of these problems where I had shown the class, um, the, you know, first derivative and second derivative, and the second, you know, we can see these get kind of complicated, right? Some of these derivatives, can, you can make some mistakes. And so he was like, you made a mistake, and um, you, know, you need to go let the professor know that you made a mistake, and you shouldn't be in there if, you, if you're making mistakes. He got all pissed off at me, and I was like, well, if I made a mistake, I made a mistake. But he, int like, he interrupted me while I was helping someone. Anyway, long story short, even though that's too late now, um, he showed me where I'd made the mistake, and actually I hadn't made a mistake. What happened is he didn't know how to simplify something algebraically. So I sat there and I had to show him how to get from one place to another. It was all algebra, and I was like, you, were, you should already know this. I mean, he was challenging me, so I got defensive. You know, I was like, look, this is all algebra. And so he and I did not like each other. He, and he also knew that I don't like being called Bobby. Okay? So he called this the Bobby method. <laughs> so my students always remember this, you know, as the Bobby method of doing this. So if that helps you, when you go into the graphing part of this, this is the Bobby method, all right? So, because you won't see this in a book, I, I guarantee you. You'll, I don't know, if you open up your book, let me see what they do. Mm, man, I don't even know what they do. Oh yeah, just if you have your book, flip to page 222 if you have it. No? No one has their books? It's okay. They do this chart. You can go refer to it later if you want. On page 222, they do a, a chart with all these pluses and minuses in there. It's, to me, when I was doing it, it was very confusing as to why they were doing all that stuff. It seemed like there had to be some easier way. And so this is what I came up with, all right? I'm not trying to say it's a good way or a bad way. It's just I like to present things the way that makes sense to me. This is the way it makes sense to me. All right, let's do it. Bobby method. Uh, now it's just a matter of what was happening. Derivative, first derivative, it was, uh, I forgot already. What was it doing to the left of uh, negative three? Uh, decrease. It was down until we got to negative three, then it was up till we got to three, and then down till we got, well, forever, right? And then on the concave, it switched a lot, right? It was concave. Down, up, down, up, down, up, and then all the way till zero, right? Yes. Then back down until we got to root uh, 27, then back up forever. And then you, this is where you do the combination of like down the frown, up the smile type thing. So down the frown is which side? Right, right side. Down the smile. Up the smile. Up the frown, left, down the frown, right, down the smile, left. We clear on all that? And then now on the bottom, we're just going to, we're just going to put our new, this is going to be our final graph, okay? We're going to put some information that we knew to start the problem off. We knew we had an x-intercept at zero, which we could have gotten that had we just plugged zero into the function, right? 
I've forgotten what the function is. Well, I haven't, but is x over x squared plus 9. I'm writing it down here so it'll be easy for us to plug stuff into it, right? When we plug 0 into that, we got 0. So that point lives there. I also know that I have uh, a horizontal asymptote out the left and right. So I'll keep that in mind as I get to my drawing here. I know it's symmetric, right, over the origin, double flip. We'll see when we draw it if that's what happens. Uh, now let's try and figure out what's happening at these, these numbers. Like at negative 3, what's happening? And then over here at negative uh, root 27. So let's, uh, let's try this. Negative root 27 in here over root 27 squared, which is 27 plus 9, which is 36. Y'all following what I'm doing? I'm just trying to figure out where I am on the graph when I plug root 27, negative root 27 in. And you get your calculator out. That's approximately, I don't know. I don't know what it is approximately. Yeah, decimal, close uh, enough. It's negative negative. 0.14. Yeah, I'm, we're getting about on this a negative 0.14, okay? Now, I'm not going to plot that point yet because I don't know what negative 3 is. Is it going to be way below or above? You know what I'm saying? So let me plug in negative 3 into this and see what I get. So f of negative 3 would give me negative 3 over... Negative 3 squared is 9 plus 9 is 18. That's what, 1 sixth? Negative 1 sixth? Which is point one, negative 0.16. Negative 0.16. You all see? So that's why I didn't want to lock myself in on the negative root 27 yet, because I don't know where this next one was. So I'm, I've got a pretty, pretty small y scale here, don't I? So maybe I should make this like, I don't know. Let's say that's like negative uh, point, point 0.2. Negative point 0.2. The negative point one would be here, right? Halfway. Negative point one four, which is where I am here, and negative root twenty seven would be somewhere. What? I don't know. I mean, you have to eyeball this, all right? It's going to be. Let's just say around here. It's going to be. If this is negative point. One five, agreed. Then that would be a little above it, and then at negative point three, it would be negative or negative point negative three. It would be negative point one six, which would be on the other side of this. Negative point negative negative. Okay, so down here, so like somewhere around here. And I could change these if I wanted to kind of spread them out a little bit to exaggerate how different they are. Do you all, does that make sense to you? Now, what's the only difference on the other side here for 3 and root 27? They're both positive. Because the only difference would be on the tops, they'd be positives. So it's going to be, again, this one is going to be higher than this one. We good? Any questions? I mean, this is just plugging those numbers into the function. And now I draw. Now I draw. So from this point over, negative root 27 from that point, out the left side, I've got to look like this. And I must approach this. So I've got to make sure it looks like the uh, left side, I mean, sorry, right side of a frown. That looks like the right side of a frown to me. And then once I get here, it's got to look like the left side of a smile until I get to that point. <laughs> and then I have right side of a smile until I get to this point. Left side of a smile until I get to this point. Right side of a smile until I get to here. And then 
left side of us. Did I say smile? I'm, I'm way out of it right now. I mean, like, I'm all, so please just, I'm saying craziness up here, like, I was off. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, I seriously am halfway here right now, and I apologize. My head is pounding up here. Uh, yeah, just because there's a couple more that we need to, um, yeah, just there's some messiness that we can get into. I mean, I would, would like to see or show you why. You got somewhere to go? You look like you got somewhere to go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if you got to go, you got to go. Yeah. But I might start optimization, just to start to give you a feel for what we're going to use this for. Oh, this is it. We're done. Okay, so it look, does it look symmetric to the origin? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Looks like a reflect, then a reflect. I can verify it uh, here with my little graphing utility. See, that took us like uh, 30 minutes. It took this like uh, five seconds. Whoa, wow. When I graph that, that doesn't look very close, does it? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's yeah, it's because of the scale, you see? So like if someone were to graph that on a calculator, they might, they might, it might be very hard pressed to tell me things like, you know, if I were to say, hey, look at that, you know, where's your local maximum? It's at three, of course, right? Where's your, uh, where's your inflection points? Very difficult to tell from something like that. <coughs> so. Mm -hmm. Because the, uh, the function is indeterminate. Mm -hmm. and yeah, infinity over infinity. So I didn't know if I was, you know, to use that. Or Absolutely. The L'Hopital, you mean? Yes, yeah, so yeah. I, I, I did it both ways. So I did it with the, uh, the L'Hopital's uh, derivative. Uh -huh. And it ended up not working out when you got to the second derivative. So that's how I knew, but I didn't know. Because we had to run across this kind of problem. Well, just remember that any time now from here on out that if you ever have a limit and you're getting a form of infinity over infinity, L'Hopital is fair game. Yeah, but I used it as, I used it as an option to figure out like the uh, f prime equals zero. Oh, okay, okay. I see. Yeah, no, it's only for that part where you're letting x go to infinity. All right. Look at another one. I thought the 25 looked interesting. I have it circled here. Let's see. I'm going to call it f of x instead of y equals the cube root of x squared minus 1. There's lots of little things that are interesting in this problem, so let's pay attention. First of all, the domain is interesting. What's the domain of that? X can't be one. X can can't be? It can be one. It's the square root is the key root is zero. So do we have a domain issue then? No. Can you take the cube root of 0? Yes. Yeah, cube root of 0, 0. Cube root of um, a negative number? Can you take the cube root of uh, negative 8? That's yeah, negative 2, right? So you can take cube roots of negative numbers. So, it's only numbers. so you don't have any issues here, right? So what makes this one interesting is just the fact that you have to pay attention. If it were square root, that would be a different story, wouldn't it? Because it's cube root, you actually don't have a domain restriction here. You can take the uh, cube root of a, a negative, you can take the cube root of a positive, and you can take the cube root of a zero. So <clears throat> your graph should, should have everything in it. 
I had the computer graph it for us ahead of time here. And it doesn't look like we have anything going on between negative 1 and 1, right? Hmm. That might be a limitation. We've seen this computer's got some problems, right? So let's see. Let's see what happens. Um, how about what's next? X intercepts? So how about x intercepts? Well, we have to set the function equal to 0, right? So if you were asked to solve that equation, <coughs> which is called a radical equation, you would do what? Cube uh, both sides. Mm -hmm. Cube both sides, mm -hmm. which would give you x squared minus 1 is 0. And then maybe, I don't know, difference of squares, or maybe move the 1 over square root. Get two answers, right? Plus or minus one? Yeah. Okay. I have two x-intercepts, so <clears throat> getting my graph going over here on the side just to keep track of things. I've got a little x-intercept here at one and a negative one. And looking up at my graph up there, kind of reassuring that it looks like that's what's happening up there too, right? Okay. Or, yeah, it doesn't look like it's happening at 1, does it? So I'm not going to trust the computer. I'm going to trust the calculus, all right? So y-intercepts. So y-intercept, you plug 0 in. You get cube root of negative 1 when you plug 0 in here, which is just negative 1. I don't see that on that picture. Do you? But do you all agree? Do you all agree that that point lives on my graph? You plug in zero, you get negative one. There's no doubt about that? Yes. Okay, so, so far, my, my math's better than the computer at this point. Or my picture's better than theirs already. <clears throat> um, what else? Symmetry. Symmetry? So does f of x equal f of negative x? So does the cube root of x squared minus 1 equal the cube root of negative x squared minus 1? Yes. yes, those are the same. Because when I square this, I get x squared. And that'll match that exactly. This is true. This means it's an even function, right? Which means it's symmetric over the y-axis. Well, that's reassuring, right? Because if it's symmetric, that point should be reflected over. It should be there, right? All right. Now asymptotes. asymptotes. So let's start with the horizontal asymptotes. Let's let x go to infinity. In fact, I'm going to do this all at one time. Now the reason I'm going to do it um, at one time is because it's an even function. Because it's even, right, being squared, then if I plug positive or negative infinity, the same thing's going to happen, isn't it? So what happens to this as x goes to infinity here? This goes to infinity. Cube root of infinity is still infinity. And so this thing becomes infinite, doesn't it? That means it does not flatten out. So that means in my picture, I just need to keep in mind that both sides, as I go out to the right, should go up, right? Which is what's happening there, according to the computer. But I don't trust the computer too much right now. How about vertical asymptotes? None, because not even, it's not even a fraction, right? I mean, like you don't have a ratio, so there's none here. <coughs> Anything else? It's derivative time? All right. So, yeah, we might want to rewrite our function first. We, want to, we might want to rewrite that as x squared minus 1 to the 1 third. Right? Now the first derivative is one third x squared minus one to the negative two thirds times two x. That's our chain rule being applied. One third comes out, we subtract one from one third, and then we take derivative of what's inside.
I'm gonna clean up a little bit, all right? Just a little bit, not much. I'm gonna move the 2x to the front, make it two-thirds. You know what, I think I'll make it two-thirds like this. Two-thirds x times x squared minus one to the negative two-thirds. <clears throat> now I realize that I could drop this to the bottom, couldn't I? Make a fraction, but I'm gonna take the derivative again. So I'd rather keep it like this and just take the derivative right here. And the reason why is because I have a product right here. And I think it'd be easier to do a product rule than a quotient rule, personally. Now when I do go back and try and figure out where the derivative, first derivative is zero, I'll probably wind up turning it into a fraction. But for the derivative's sake, I'm gonna leave it like that. So my second derivative is product rule. Derivative of the first part is just two-thirds, right? times the x squared minus one to the negative two-thirds, plus, now the derivative of this. Negative two-thirds comes out, x squared minus one to the negative five-thirds, right? Because you have to subtract one from negative two-thirds, so negative five-thirds times two x, that's the derivative of the inside, times 2 thirds x. I think that's safe to say that that's a disaster of algebra there, right? You looking forward to that? Yes. Yes, all right, good. So let's, let's try that first derivative. Let's try and clean it up. I'll, I'll do it right here. I'm going to try and write it as a fraction first. So I have a 2 and an x on top. On the bottom, I have a 3 that was down there. And then I have the cube root of x squared minus 1 squared. Isn't that what that is? And I think I'm willing to work with that. Are you willing to work with that? You OK with this? OK. Raising something to the two-thirds, negative two-thirds means you drop it down. Raising it to two-thirds means you're squaring it and taking the cube root. Now this one is much more difficult to work with. But I'm gonna clean it up while I've got here. Do I, do I have any questions? Okay, so here we go. This one I'm gonna rewrite as um, two over three and then cube root of x squared minus 1 squared. All right, we got a lot going on here. We're going to have a minus, a 2, a 2, and a 2, right? It's going to be 8. 8 over what? Or whoa. Is there anything still up there with the 8? I have an x and an x, x squared, 8x squared on top. And on the bottom, that, that was all that was on top, right? Yes. Okay, on the bottom I have a 3 and a 3, 9. And then I have the cube root of x squared minus 1 to the fifth power. I encouraged you on your homework way back during chain rule to try and match your answer to the back of the book, specifically because of things like this. That this is where you have to, you know, we're gonna have to set that to zero at some point, right? And that means we'll probably need a common denominator and, yeah. So why don't we just delay the pain of this and move, and just go back to the first derivative and do our chart and everything, you wanna do that now? And then just we'll come back and suffer through this? All right. Just remember that, I'm gonna ask you for that in a little bit. All right, so where is the function going up? Where is the function going down? So where is the function going up and down? Question, well, we need to know when the derivative was zero, which is when two x is zero, right? Which is x is zero. So we just wanna know when this top was zero.
We also know, excuse me? We want to know when the, when the derivative is undefined. Well, now we have a fraction. And it could be possible that maybe that's zero. What would make this zero? If we had zero under the cube root, right? How is that going to be a zero then? When that's a zero, right? How is that going to be a zero? When x is 1 or negative 1, right? If x is 1, this is 0. Squared 0, cube root of 0, 0, times 3, 0, division by 0. <coughs> or negative 1, right? So, I mean, technically, here's what we're doing. We're saying, when is this undefined? Well, when 3 cube root of x squared minus 1 squared equals 0. Then you could divide both sides by 3. You could cube both sides. You could take the square root on both sides. You can do all the algebra for it, but it's easier to just look. It's just when that's 0, right? So x squared equals 1, x is plus or minus 1. Three critical points, right? Three critical numbers. That's it, right? Draw a number line, break it up, test points. So here's my number line. I've got uh, 0, 1, negative 1. Sure. Whatever you want, as long as it's not on those. So let's try negative 2 into the derivative, right? Let's plug it in right here. What can you tell me about the bottom? I mean, like, no matter what I plug in here, right, <clears throat> I'm going to square it and take the cube root. When you square something, it's always positive. The cube root of a positive number is positive. Times 3 is still positive. So isn't the bottom always positive? So all that really matters is what the top is, right? So if I plug in um, negative 2, I'm going to get negative 4 on top, which means it's going to be going down. But if I plug in negative 1 half, the same thing happens. I get negative again, don't I? See, it didn't switch this time, did it? 1 half, plug in, I should get positive, right? And then positive. See, I'm doing that without actually plugging anything in. I'm just thinking through it, right? And I would encourage you to do that also, <clears throat> when possible. If you actually have to sit here and go negative 2 and write it all out, negative 2, uh, get an answer. It's going to take you, you know, maybe a minute for each one of those. It's going to take up some time. Question. Do we have local max? No. Local min? Yes. As long as 0 is in the domain of the function. Is 0 in the domain of the original function? Yes. In fact, we know 0 lives on the graph right here. So we're, we know that that point's there. Okay. Now we need that uh, second derivative. Crap. Don't tell me what it is. Let me see if I can remember it. <clears throat> I think it was um, 2 over 3 cube roots of x squared minus 1 squared minus 8x squared over 9 cube roots of x squared minus 1 to the fifth. Is that it? Close enough? That's it? OK, I can't be off by anything. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right. So I need to know when that's 0. Because what I'm trying to figure out is when this function, uh, sorry, when the original function is concave up and concave down, right? That's my question. <coughs> I forgot to put that on the last problem when we were doing it. I forgot to actually, because I stepped out of the room. But that's what the second derivative work is going to tell us, where it's concave up and down. So uh, how about we set that thing equal to 0? Sure. Well, we need a common denominator, don't we? 
Now there's different ways to work with this algebraically. One, we could convert this back into x squared minus 1 to the 2 thirds, make this one x squared minus 1 to the 5 thirds and get a common denominator that way. Or we could leave it like this and work with it. It's, it's really kind of up to you and what you're comfortable with. So do you want me to stick with the radical notation or do you want me to go back to rational exponents? The radical, the middle one's easier. You want, okay, so you want me to work with this one? Okay, if I was going to work with this one, what I would do is I'd realize that the power in here is bigger than the, the root. And so because it's a cube root, doesn't this mean that any time I have a factor repeated three times, I can pull it out as a factor? That's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to rewrite this, this one piece, and just to save space and time, I'm going to pull out one of the factors of x squared minus 1, and inside here I'll still have cube root of x squared minus 1 to what power though? To the second, to the second power. So let me write over here what I did, just in case you have no clue what I just did. If I say what's the cube root of u to the fifth power, this is the cube root of u times u times u times u times u, which is the same as cube root of u cubed times cube root of u squared. And what's the cube root of u cubed? Cube root of u cubed. Just, just u, right? And then this is still here, cube root of u squared. So I'm just using the fact that if this number is bigger than this one, you can always get something out of the root. That makes sense? Okay. So now, what I like about this way of doing it, <coughs> I think it's easy to see the common denominator. We're in, we have this and this are here, right? And both of them? This one has a 9, this one has a 3. So what am I missing? 3 times the quantity of x squared minus 1. Yeah, this one is just missing a 3 to make it a 9. And then this x squared minus 1 cubed, isn't it? So I'm going to introduce on the top and bottom here a 3 and then x squared minus 1 cubed on top and bottom. That'll be my next line. So this second derivative is equal to, I'm multiplying 3 x squared minus 1 cubed on the top and bottom of this first fraction. I already had this there. So that's my, that's my introduction right here of a hidden one that was next to that fraction on the left, right? That'll create the common denominator. And I still have this is all still here. So when I put these together, I'll have my common denominator, which will be my 9x squared minus 1 cubed, and then the cube root, cube root of x squared minus 1 squared. My numerator? 6 times x squared minus 1 cubed minus 8x squared. That does not look enjoyable at all. What number was this? What was it? 25. It is 25. Let me just check something here. I brought the answers because I, I knew how I was feeling today. I was like, hmm. Yeah. So they used a quotient rule, which helped a little bit with the simplification, but I think we can still get it there, okay? I mean, that's it. That's our, that's our second derivative. Can't really, it is what it is, man. All right, so what are we supposed to do with the second derivative? Set it to zero. All right, so second derivative 